over to you, Jerry. We can begin. All right, good day, everyone, and welcome to um, this UHC and COVID-19 operationalizing commitments to leave no one behind side event at the 75th United Nations General Assembly. I am truly honored to be hosting this meeting. My name is Jerry Elston. I am a TB ambassador, a survivor, a Stop TB partnership, uh, uh, I guess, ambassador for the last whew, 20 years. It's been a long road for me, um, but a very fruitful one also. Um, I'm really honored to be hosting this conversation uh, on behalf of the Norwegian Red Cross uh, Civil Society Engagement Mechanisms for you, uh, H for 2030, the Stop TB Partnership Campaign, International Federation of the Red Cross, Red Crescent. Um, and this is going to be a rather robust conversation, I hope. Um, our panel is made up of activists out of various uh, spheres of life, um, all, all with regards to TB. And so I'm hoping that there are some calls to action and some truly um, uh, thought-provoking conversations to be had over the next little while. Uh, we'll keep our comments short but but punchy. Uh, there's nothing I like more than a, and then a good hearty conversation. I see that Maureen um, has joined the conversation. Welcome Maureen. Thank you. Would you like to start your introduction or? Oh yes, I will. All right, take over from me then. Thank you very much, everyone. I had a little challenge with technology. I hope you can now hear me well. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this event on uh, operationalizing commitments to leave no one behind around UHC and COVID-19. Uh, my name, like you've been told, is Maureen Murenga. I am... Um, uh, the executive director of Lean On Me Foundation, and I'm also in the uh, a delegation member of the Stop TB Partnership, as well as in the uh, Global Fund Board. So I also want to thank the Norwegian Red Cross. I want to thank Stop TB Partnership, the Civil Society Engagements for Mechanism for UHC 2030 system and IFRC for putting this event together. And I want to emphasize that our collective commitment to leave no one behind is a cornerstone of the 2030 agenda, and it is vital to the implementation of the strategic development three to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And I always add that in every corner of this globe. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed us uh, to existing inequalities. It has actually uh, laid bare our inequalities in health, uh, in vulnerability, stigma, and uh, marginalized communities are high at risk. Not only are they, very, are they particularly vulnerable to the pandemic, but their access to health services is also being interrupted by COVID-19. And we have seen that in, in, in the areas we work in, in where we live, and in the different media being reported. A core element of reaching the last mile, communities first in COVID-19 response and beyond, is implementing universal health coverage. COVID-19 has actually, has actually brought to light the importance of actualizing universal health coverage beyond um, beyond, beyond data, beyond our commitments, but to actually do the work and actualize uh, universal health coverage. Fundamentally, UHC is about equity and discussions about protecting the most vulnerable must be central and operationalized. This makes it urgent and it reappraises how to develop more equitable and resilient systems of health that leave no one behind. I choose to use the word systems of health because I know we cannot reach um, universal health coverage without the community response. And therefore systems of health encompasses 
both health systems and community systems. There is need for global and national plans to get health responses back on track. There is need to advance access to real-time data and data desegregated by key and vulnerable populations. We need to scale up investment in communities, including community-led mo mo monitoring and structural reforms, promoting enabling environments. We need to, uh, the need for UHC and COVID responses to include elements of community governance and community decision-making to be right-based and people-centered, not top-down and to be guided by principles of accessibility, availability, acceptability, and quality, as well as broader human rights perspective. And as part of this, to ensure comprehensive and inclusive social protection system, the needs to protect healthcare workers and reinvest in research and development is even bigger now. So this event seeks to amplify institutional commitments to UHC, particularly to reach the last mile communities first in the COVID-19 response and recovery by highlighting opportunities for implementing UHC, centering our shared commitments to leave no one behind. You will hear from um, the Minister of International Development of the Government on, of Norway, colleagues from the IFRC and Red Cross and the Red Crescent National Societies will set the scene. The panel of civil society leaders will share the challenges and opportunities of accessing health services in the time of COVID-19. As the global community works to design and implement inclusive people-centered, community-responsive COVID-19 response and recovery, last mile communities must come first. The people we have always left behind traditionally need to be the ones we reflect on and bring first into this response. So with those many remarks, I will now introduce our moderator, Gary Elston, TV star and TB survivor, Stop TB Partnership Champion and former IFRC Global TB Ambassador. Welcome. Jerry, you're on mute. My humble apologies. I was speaking to my plants, it seems. Um, <laughs> um, it's so wonderful to be with you. And uh, we're going to jump straight into the program. I'm going to ask that the Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies um, please begin with his address. I am happy to, to be online with you, Mr. Jagan Shampagang. Um, I, I've always, I've loved the Red Cross since I was a little girl. Um, I always wear red when I'm busy with my TV work. Um, and knowing that you've been a volunteer with the Red Cross um, for so many years makes it even, even better of an honor. Please uh, give us your introduction words, please. Now you're on mute. I'm so happy I'm not alone in the uh world. Yeah, I'm just unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for such a kind introduction, J.D. I'm so pleased to be here, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Um, all over the world, uh, last mile communities struggle to get the healthcare services they need. This is even more apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic, as we heard earlier. Uh, the persons with disabilities, members of the LGBTQI community, drug users, and so-called undocumented persons experience layered vulnerabilities and further exclusion from healthcare services. Ensuring access to health and care for these communities upon left behind is a humanitarian imperative and is now more pressing than ever. In June this year, uh, the Norwegian Red Cross and IFRC jointly launched the Last Mile Report the, uh, that identified these vulnerable groups in countries that are in the last mile in terms of healthcare services. This report laid out important recommendations on greater investment by the humanitarian sectors in reaching these hard to reach communities, including the importance of protection, gender, and inclusion in reducing barriers to healthcare. 
Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies and other local actors in the communities play a central role in supporting governments to prioritize and achieve universal health coverage, especially in hard to reach areas. Today, as we discuss how we can better deliver more inclusive, people-centered and community responsive access to healthcare, I offer five important points to con consider. Number one, community volunteers are central to reach the last mile with health services and their role must be more explicitly recognized it's critical to human resources for health. Their time and effort are major assets that should be universally recognized, appreciated, and promoted. Number two, greater investments in community-based health workers and volunteers are needed to ensure they achieve their full potential and are fully valued as local providers of healthcare for the most underserved. Number three, Meaningful engagement of community-based organizations like the local branches of Red Cross and Red Crescent National Society and many other local uh, civil society actors is critical to putting people at the center of the global health agenda. Number four, addressing the unmet health needs of vulnerable or marginalized population who are not served by formal health systems during emergencies must be our urgent and collective priorities in all countries. The health, number five, the health and well-being of all community health workers and volunteers is critical for them to be able to help others. Adequate attention and support is needed to address the unique challenges and vulnerabilities that workers and caregivers themselves may experience. Reaching vulnerable communities is often seen as the last mile. But for us in the IFRC network, this is the first mile. We must all work together in solidarity to better adapt our responses to last mile challenges and to put people at the center of the global health agenda. Thank you. Over to you, Jenny. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we're excited to have you online with us. Uh, I know that there will be many, many questions. Having said that, uh, if we're not aware of it, there is a Q&A button on the forum. If you have any questions, by all means, please uh, do let us know what they are. You won't be able to ask your questions or give your comments personally. They do have to go through me, but I would like uh, to be able to put as many questions and comments to our panel, particularly as we can. Um, the only reason we're doing it that way is so that we can use our, our time uh, as well as possible. I'm now honored to welcome our next uh, speaker. It is Bernd Appelant, who is the Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross and has been since 2016. Uh, he was formerly the General um, Secretary General of UNICEF Norwegia and uh, by all means knows who we are, what we do from various spheres. Um, he's impacted the Red Cross and the work of, of young people throughout his, his career. He's currently the chairman of the board of the virtual fundraising hub for the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement. Certainly a role that has become so, so important during this time when we are unable to all meet together. So Mr. Upland, I hand over to you. Thank you so much for, <coughs> for those kind words, uh, Gary. Uh, and, and uh, there all, I would, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to share some of the insights from the, in the last mile report that uh, Yagan referred to that we published together with the, with the IFRC before this summer. Um, health in the last mile or, or the first mile, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a term that too many, will bring, uh, too many will bring images of remote villages uh, where access to healthcare and medicine can be scarce. The findings in, in this report, however, remind us that there is a last mile in all places, all communities, and all countries. Um, it highlights the groups in all kinds of societies that are left behind, that must overcome larger barriers than the rest of us to access the assistance they need. Even here in Norway, uh, where a country that to most of you is a, a country of care and prosper prosperity. There is a last mile. 
For the past decade, the Red Cross and the Church uh, City Mission have managed a healthcare center for so-called uh, illegal or undocumented immigrants because the authorities have failed to secure them basic and often life-saving healthcare. This report aims to give insight to the key questions. Who is living in the last mile? Where and what is the last mile? Why are people pushed to the last mile? And most importantly, how can these people be reached? Over the past decades, significant progress has been made to improve health outcomes and universal health coverage. But despite the UN's ambition to leave no one behind, millions of people continue to be cut off from access to health services. They are not part of the positive trend. There is no doubt a need for a change in approach and strategy on many levels if we are to reach uh, sustainable development goal number three and ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. And so I hope this report will inspire the humanitarian and development sector to invest more in reaching populations living in the last mile. Uh, and with that, I would like to give uh, the word uh, to my friend and colleague uh, from the Palestinian Red Crescent, Ms. Dalal Ataji. Thank you. Can you on? Yes, you're unmuted. We can hear you now. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I really thank uh, I, all of you for inviting me to this um, uh, great webinar. Uh, my name is Dalal al -Taji. I'm from the Palestine Red Crescent Society, Head of Continuing Education Department and Lecturer at the University of Disability Development. Uh, I really am privileged to participate with you here. I like when I first looked at this, uh, the title of the webinar, I like the term no one, leaving no one behind. And I think we need to do that. I would like to start with a quote that is in the context of persons with disabilities, but I think it should be in the context of all people who are ex excluded. Nothing about us without us. Persons with disability and, uh, and persons excluded are excluded in, in general. But when it comes to a health crisis like COVID-19, where everybody is vulnerable, including persons with disability, including persons with health problems, I think we should put into consideration the needs and the challenges and the uh, positive aspect also of, what, uh, of people, persons with disability. Uh, as a person with disability working in a humanitarian society, living in a humanitarian context in the Gaza Strip, it's not as easy to, to, to deal with things as it is. Uh, no wonder with COVID-19. Living in Gaza, Gaza has a very poor, poor healthcare system in general. Medicines are not easy to get in because we are under siege. Um, health um, health facilities are going down. We have electricity problems, which means that when the electricity cuts, it makes it difficult for hospitals or for health uh, to, to work. Also, uh, having internet, internet is not as easy as, as it should be. So all these challenges, plus, of course, getting access to information as a person with disability because if you go to websites and you have you have you see maps and you see uh, numbers of statistics of persons with COVID-19 where you would like to, to to be in touch it's not easy because the access to the information is not as easy as it should be so I think uh, we will ho we hopefully today we will be able to um, address these issues the issue of inclusion of persons with disability or inclusion, let's say not only with persons with disability, but inclusion of everyone in this crisis and how we can overcome these challenges without leaving anybody uh, behind, without leaving anybody in the community behind. And I think that challenges are great. We in the Palestine Recursion Society have faced a lot of challenges when, when this started. First of all, it started, the COVID-19 came suddenly, so nothing was planned in advance. Secondly, it was not easy to reach out for everybody in the beginning because 
people were at homes and we have checkpoints, we, especially in the West Bank, so it's not easy to get to people, of course, with this quarantine situation. But on the other hand, we were able to overcome at least most of these challenges, and I will talk about that later when I present the, um, the services. And we will, we are, we would, we hope that we can try more and more because I know that the uh, IFRC and uh, is going towards inclusion and going towards not leaving anybody behind. So I think I would leave it now to over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dalal. I think what she brings up is precisely the efforts we're attempting and uh, to overcome and the things we are attempting to change. Because when we talk about not leaving anyone behind, we need to look at each and every individual and their environments in full. Um, you know, we need to develop the TV plans that will ensure that we get back on track, but in areas like Palestine, where, where we haven't even reached a first goal, we need to think about how we go back and uh, get them caught up to the rest of the world, even though some might feel we're not far enough. The fact is that we need to be talking about the structural barriers that are in place, enabling environments where we can talk about health systems, the right to access, the stigmas and discriminations that, that we have to deal with in, in societies and within the groups and that we, that we are speaking to here today. So this is absolutely um, the forum. So thank you again, Dalal. Right now, uh, we have a video that we would like to share with you. It is the, the remarks by Doug Inga Oldstein, who is the Minister of Development in Norway. First of all, let me thank the Red Cross, Red Crescent, for this important and extremely timely report, The Last Mile. Together with education, global health has been one of the main tools in Norway's development strategy for at least two decades now. Because it saves lives and because it allows people to work and thus brings us all closer to a world without extreme poverty. But as we were preparing to run the last mile, the pandemic hit. Our conviction that global health is crucial was confirmed in the most dramatic way. Millions of people across the world are suffering because they have lost their loved ones or because they are facing severe consequences of the COVID-19 response. The engagement of the whole Red Cross, Red Crescent movement to secure fair and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine and your call for a people's vaccine is very important. This is how we reach our shared goal of true global cooperation, solidarity and fair distribution of vaccines. We look forward to working with you and other partners in civil society to make this happen. The last mile report reminds us of existing health challenges that we need to tackle in addition to COVID-19. We will not give up on our 2030 goals and the report provides good advice on where and how we should concentrate our efforts. One of the biggest challenges is to reach the poor and the most vulnerable with health care they can afford. At least half of the world's population lack access to health care. More than 800 million people must spend more than 10% of their income on health care. At the current pace, up to one third of the world's population will remain underserved in 2030. Our effort must be intensified. The report provides important information on the state of countries' health services and where we find the biggest shortcomings. We will certainly consider including the 13 recommendations in our global health and humanitarian policy. It is not surprising that the countries at the top of our list are low-income countries and that all the top 25 countries have undergone crisis, disasters or conflicts. In addition, attacks on health personnel and facilities are a challenge in all conflicts and hit the health sector severely. In order to reach our goals, we must strengthen both the health sector and the compliance with humanitarian law. Health facilities, patients and personnel must be protected. To conclude, 
I find that the report underlines the importance of our work for the long-term goal of health for all. Together, the pandemic and this report underscore the importance of strengthening primary health care in the most disadvantaged countries, rather than just focusing on specific diseases. The report also shows the need to reach the most vulnerable. This is how we build back better. This is how we ensure that people survive and thrive. This is how we run the last mile. I'd like to introduce our uh, panel for today. Uh, I'm going to start with Domiso Gacha, who is the founder of Success Capital NGO. Domiso is a feminist human rights defender, a founder of Success Capital NGO and the LGBTIQ um, youth-led, managed, and serving grassroots organization. That's a long title, Demisa, but great. Um, they also <laughs> help um, to continually navigate a path for survivors um, of, of all types of, of turmoil. Uh, Demi, thank you for joining us. Just, just wave or just open your mic and say hello so I can, there you are. Thank you. And Hi, welcome. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Please also welcome um, Massimo Barra, who is a medical doctor who has two major priorities in his life, uh, the recovery of people with drug disorders and the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Ah, we share a passion. He's also the uh, chairman of the Red Cross Red Crescent Partnership on Substance Abuse, the president of the European RCRC a network for HIV hepatitis and drugs, as well as the co-chairman of the Rome Consensus Humanitarian Drug Policy Initiative. Um, Massimo, if you can say a quick wave and a hello for us, please. I'm, I'm hoping that he did that. Someone just split my screen. Um, uh, <laughs> let's try and get that grid back. Do you see me? Hi, Massimo. Good to okay. see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Our, our next panelist is Marta Royo, who is um, the executive director of Pro Familia in, or became that in 2012, Colombia's largest standing government, non-government organization that protects and advocates for sexual and reproductive rights. Wow. Uh, especially those of women and the youth. And in this case, she's managed to implement uh, successful social enterprise models while working toward making Pro Familia a sustainable organization. Welcome, Marta. Hi, everybody. Good to have you on, uh, on the call. Uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar, welcome. Find. Namaskar from Namaskar India. First, but let me introduce you. You're the Secretary General and the Executive Director of Kolkata Arista India, a transgender community based organization who uh, works for gender and sexual minority communities in India. Uh, she also has extensive experience in facilitating workshops and training for the community on issues of health sex, transsexuality, uh, gender, uh, human rights, sexual health, and engaging with men and boys to stop gender-based uh, violence. Dr. Kumar, welcome to you. Thank you. <laughs> and now let me welcome Mohammed uh, Badamasi. Welcome. Um, Mohammed is a volunteer with the Nigerian Red Cross and he works to support nomadic populations and giving them access to medical uh, support where and how possible. And then we also have on the panel, um, it's very unfortunate on Zoom that you cannot see everyone, but I will introduce everyone. Princess Hewana from the Vereniging uh, branch uh, of the South African Red Cross. She's been with the South African Red Cross for nine years and six months. 
very specific and she's responsible for health and care and um, she assists with the victims of crime within the branch. So welcome to you, Princess. Also on, on the line with us, hi Princess, I, I see you up there, wonderful. Um, you need to come and visit. Uh, we can't both be in the same country and I've never met you. There are things I'm calling you out on. Jacqueline Vickers, hello Jacqueline, is the Director for Migration and Health Division for IOM at the headquarters in Geneva. Uh, she works in the domain of migrant health for Wow, 25 years on the Asian Pacific region and at the headquarters, um, that's my mother. You'll forgive the flower arranger in the background there. Um, just give me one moment. All the fascinations of uh, having to work at home. Yesterday I was on a call and someone had three children jump into the into the screen. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Vickers, I know that you're on the call. Uh, she advises the member states, partners and colleagues on the management of migration health issues, relevant strategies and policy development. It's wonderful to have you on board. Um, I'm going to ask the same first question of you, uh, Domiso. Um, what are some of the um, some of the operational challenges that we that you've experienced in the work that you do coming into the COVID nineteen uh, uh, challenges that we've had? Um, thank you so much. Um, I think it's really quite important to just highlight um, only 400,000 out of a possible 1.1 million Botswana um, are formally employed. And this is from a population of 2.1 million. And about 36,000 actually earn over 1,000 US dollars a month. So this highlights high levels of unemployment, underemployment and poverty. And in working with different young people, particularly those in rural areas, there were significant divides. So there's the first, which would be a queer divide, acknowledging that there are certain vulnerabilities as a result of variant or non-normative uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And um, there was a digital divide as well, with internet access becoming a challenge. And so then this would obviously impact, one, uh, the availability of telehealth, and secondly, uh, the ability for individuals to be able to secure travel permits to be able to access services. We have recorded that preparedness is an issue, particularly when um, community health systems have been in place uh, within the HIV response that could have been well equipped and, and enabled within the six month state of emergency that Botswana was under to be able to appropriately respond, align, and ensure that um, uh, services are not just met or aligned, but that they're strengthened. Um, and I think it's really quite critical to then us uh, that is quite elitist um, in that it obviously expects of you to have the means to be able to access the means of adherence. Um, and having been one of the individuals who had actually um, not just been assessed, but received food parcels, um, I can say that there's a certain element of indignity in that process. Um, they're administratively cumbersome uh, uh, hoops that one has to uh, 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 jump. One has to also then perform poverty because um, there's a certain level of eligibility that is needed. Um, and this is a country that has over 30 um, uh, social protection programs. However, with the COVID-19 burden of care work, with the COVID-19 burden of not necessarily having uh, adequate internet access, there were individuals who had significant challenges um, in terms of nutrition uh, so that they can be able to adhere to their medication and also more importantly, mental health. Um, we're acknowledging that there were significant gaps for individuals where we've even lost a life and um, 
you know, uh, even within our own alternative shelter, we had three who attempted to commit suicide. And I think, you know, just some of these leakages can be prevented. For instance, um, if someone has tried to take their own life by taking pills and you are to diagnose that individual and uh, provide treatment in the form of pills is a bit of, an, uh, a, a, of a paradox. Um, and so I think that there's certain things that, you know, community health workers and volunteers, more importantly, such as ourselves, um, can do because not only are we affected, but we have to live and feel some of the challenges that we um, uh, uh, go through. And I think it's really critical, uh, specifically for those who are survivors of, of violence. Um, we had one who was the worst individual who had to endure um, uh, um, uh, sexual assault for 55 days over the first lockdown. Um, and, you know, I think when you, when you think about, you know, a healing process within that context and not being able to move or connect with other members of the community, um, it then shows how glaringly inequality is prevalent within the context of health. And I think what's critical um, is a key ask that um, UHC 2030 has made in terms of moving together. And for me, that speaks to SDG 16, which is partnerships where multi-stakeholder partnerships, inclusive of law enforcement and the judiciary and psychosocial services are really quite critical to ensuring that those who are most vulnerable can appropriately be accommodated in a manner that is dignified, uh, equitable, and non-ableist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Demi. So you bring up some, some absolutely valid points. The one thing that COVID-19 um, did uncover was the levels of poverty um, that are um, that we've claimed are invisible in so many parts of the world. And of course, the, the way in which households had been in, affected by the lack of income. The, the, one of the big things, of course, when it comes to TB was that interruption of, of services, not just of medications, but we need to recognize that in some countries, uh, people go to their clinics also for nutrition. And sometimes the nutrition they receive at these clinics are sometimes the only meals, the only food packages they'll get for a long time. So when there was the, the interruption of services, it wasn't just about medication, it was about um, the needs of so many. So thank you for, for that response. Um, I'm going to throw a question at you, Massimo, uh, because I believe that what uh, Demiso mentioned hugely impacts communities um, who, who live with, with drug challenges also. Can you reflect for us on, on how interrupted uh, health services um, and inadequate health coverage, in fact, can impact a drug user, particularly now in the time of, of COVID-19? Okay, thank you, Chair. Dear friends, substance abuse, along with armed conflict, is one of the major unsolved cause of human suffering, with million people affected who are not receiving adequate help and treatment, or even worse, are totally left behind because of the stigma and hate against them. Especially now, the pandemic risks to become the perfect excuse behind which to justify further inaction against the person that I call sick for drugs. Our personal experience in the field here in Rome, in the Villa Maraini Recovery Drug Center, where we meet and treat more than 600 drug users every day, showed us that the drug consumption didn't find any limitation also during the lockdown. We have monitored and checked the health conditions of thousands of them in the last months. Despite their risky behaviors, no one was found infected or sick by COVID-19. Based on this experience, we can say that all the limitations put by the public health services to treat and meet them due to the fears related to the virus are not justified. Also in light of their particular immune situation, who deserves further and deeper studies. Therefore, all therapeutic activities can and must 
be continued, continued to protect them, in particular, harm reduction, substitution therapies, alternative measures to prison. We and all the workers in this field are deeply concerned for the scarce resources available to tackle drug problems by the states, especially now that the health system is mainly focused on COVID-19 response. Despite the good declarations from policymakers and the increase in scientific evidence, the best practices available to address the drug health problem are poorly implemented. There are still too many governments all over the world that adopt inadequate strategy to improve the quality of life of people with drug disorders. In some other countries, governments continue to ignore the health consequences of those who are affected by drugs by considering them just as criminal and therefore are punished and imprisoned instead of being treated. Indeed, one of four of the inmates in all the world are in prison for drug reasons, and they are forced to live in a pathologic and pathogenic environment where their disease is not treated at all. Arm reduction programs are crucial. Governments need to make clear and urgent moves toward health and right-based approach. For example, by providing alternative measures in the criminal justice field, like the pre-arrest deflection and diversion. Treatment and punishment cannot work together. Treating people sick for drugs should be a common interest of all the governments international community must find a concrete strategy that can change people's lives, like it has been done with the Global Fund against HIV, TB, and malaria. Global Fund changed the world. For this reason, in the last months, together with other international experts on substance abuse, we discuss about the idea to create a new global fund specific for drug world problem. A global fund based on humanitarian drug policy could be an effective tool to truly mitigate the health conditions of millions of people marginalized, stigmatized, and left behind. Making easier the access to health for these vulnerable groups will also dramatically decrease the rate of violence and deaths all over the world and bring us closer to the goal of universal health coverage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Massimo. You know, um, the challenge of stigma, it is the, the dual stigmas that must be faced by people who also have drugs challenges when even as a survivor, I know that it didn't matter who I was in my society. I was a television personality. I was known across my country, but I had tuberculosis. And my story is that people took a wide berth when they saw me, when they found out I had TB. They were no longer the stepping up to me to get a, to get, you know, by my fans to get my signature. I was, I was now persona non grata. And if you if you add um, to that that someone might be challenging might be having challenges with drugs it just sends them further and further the the, the crevice between society and them between treatment and them just gets wider and wider so uh yeah i'm i'm so happy to have you on the on the panel massimo and uh these are certainly questions that that we must cover. I have a quick question for Dr. Santosh. Um, can you reflect for us on the unmet needs of the, the Hydra community in, in the COVID response? Just give us some, some context on the significance of the UHC for, for the community that you work in. Well, thank you very 
very much for asking me the question. And as a trans person and TV survivor, I'm happy to uh, share some of the things which is very much uh, in our daily life at the TV Israel community, mainly in India and some part of South Asia too. Uh, in this pandemic, it has become clear that human health is interconnected. And it is also clear that the vulnerable communities in terms of caste, class, religion, region and the gender are more pretty surprised to the health of risk and compared to others. And while many of the agencies and governments are trying to come up with the vaccines to minimize the loss of human lives, a major issue how to reach the last mile communities like transgender. Today, the majority of transgender persons live in a condition of poverty and ache out of their livelihood, primarily through begging and sex work. Both of these are the image of the work and essential high level and public presence of physical contact, which social distancing having been mandated, and rightly so to prevent further or furthering of virus, transgenders have been went away from their only source of work. Additionally, transgender person is further vulnerable become of lack of food, security, housing, city, income, access of healthcare, sanitizing facilities, etc. A high prevalence of HIV makes the community more susceptible to the COVID-19 Further, the culture of community-based living in poor hygienic uh, condition and uh, treated the situation of danger within the community to spread coronavirus. They might be able to continue with their profession in the coming months. If when the pandemic subsides, second, they have been ostracized by the gender normative society since then. In the context of COVID-19 outbreak, they face the the greater risk of violence. Therefore, the impact of pandemic in daily lives and sexual minority is immense. And in such context, Kolkata is the transgender community-based organization working in the four states of India, Bihar, Jharkhand, Uttar Pradesh, and West Bengal, advocates the policy to join pandemic management, GPM, uh, JPM, and urging uh, uh, participation on the local bodies, civil societies, communities, and the government, you know, central government, state governments to urge the creation of advocacy in the grassroots level to make the optimum allocation of resource and address to the current crisis. I just want to add a very vital point that there will be no universal health coverage without universal human rights, and which is very important, and which we have seen. And if we really want to see any changes, I think there's supposed to be a program started which is led by the transgender community or LGBTQHAI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we had some challenges with the audio, but I'm sure we, we all understood um, what you were attempting to say. Uh, now, when it comes to people on the move, um, they often experience exacerbated inequities uh, in access to the coverage that they, that they need um, because they are disproportionately experiencing the impact of a pandemic uh, due to, um, due to their, their weakened social support structures and, you know, their eco, socioeconomic environments. Um, aren't conducive to, to what they require, but also their risk of, of exploitation and abuse is sometimes even higher. I want to bring Mohammed uh, Badasami from the Nigerian Red Cross into the conversation. He's um, with us via audio file. Um, so welcome, Mohammed. You work amongst the nomadic um, communities of Nigeria. So what has been your experience in terms of how uh, hi Mohammed, there you are oh I'm really loving technology what has been your experience about how COVID has infected the community that already was struggling with access uh, to health care and TV care 
how has this extra layer of the pandemic of COVID-19 impacted your communities? Uh, my name is uh, Mohamed Badamasi. I'm the Nigerian Red Cross Society Divisional Secretary for the Musa Local Government Kazina State. I am currently working on a CDC supported project on AFP surveillance and social mobilization for oral polio vaccination campaign in security compromised areas. Uh, the reason why some community are excluded from access to service is due to the ongoing armed banditry kidnapping, and also hard to reach. Uh, the conflict has restricted services in Kazina State due to fear of uh, being killed or kidnapped by armed bandits. Also, there are issues with community members migrating due to fear of banditry attacks. The roads are inaccessible due to their bad condition, which in turn requires taking a longer route to access services. Uh, there are issues with poor telephone network in some hard to reach local government areas, which affects data reporting between the community-based volunteers and divisional secretaries, as well as DSNO. Uh, being a hard to reach settlement, the pharmacy stroke health facilities are mostly very far away from the reach of the communities. So due to this, the community members turn to alternate services such as traditional healers, patients and proprietary medicine store, traditional bed attendants for their services. Uh, the Red Cross mobilized their community-based volunteers who are trusted by the community members in the affected areas to provide the following services such as community-based service for AFP, stroke delivery of polio vaccination, social mobilization for yellow fever campaign or vaccination. Then um, if I can recall, on, uh, on Wednesday, June 26, 2019, uh, a volunteer was kidnapped while on a mission alongside 30 people in Anka local government area of Zamfara State. The volunteer was on his way to submit weekly report to the divisional secretary at the local government area headquarters. He spent five days in captivity and escaped when his abductors were asleep without ransom being paid. He was very lucky. Uh, then also recently on the 30th of August, if I can recall, uh, on the 30th of August 2020, three Red Cross volunteers from GBA were attacked on their way to a three review training, but managed to escape being kidnapped. Yes. Uh, then, as regard to Red Cross volunteer, there are no difficulties getting data from the field due to COVID-19 lockdown because Red Cross is recognized as a partner and is supporting the COVID-19 response across the 36 states and Abuja, FCT. I think uh, that's all I can say. Uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, we actually have, I'd, I'd actually like to bring Princess into the conversation. You also work in the area of migration. Um, I mean, the, the, the comments and the, the, the stories that Mohammed just, just mentioned, um, I'm, I'm going to risk it and say it's not as challenging for us in South Africa in terms of the dangers for, for, for migrants, but we have our own challenges in South Africa, don't we? Yes, true, Gary. We do have uh, challenges in South Africa. Uh, as we're working in this community, we found that there are a lot of migrants and there's different nationalities of migrants that are classified as refugees, asylum seekers, as well as undocumented migrants. So during this lockdown, um, it was so difficult for the migrants to access uh, these social services and grants that were given by the government. So we had to do 
as the South African Red Cross to intervene and assist our migrants that are uh, in our community. So plus minus, if I can check, maybe the ones that we have uh, helped them during this COVID-19 is plus minus close to 6,000 of the migrants that we have. So not included in this uh, uh, government programs, it was difficult for them to, to have a living. So we started to give them, because as we checked, we, when we assessed, we did see that in terms of healthcare, it is difficult for them to go and access the, 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 the healthcare services. It was a challenge again to do testing, screening, and even contact tracing. It was even difficult for them to provide their families. Remember with the COVID uh, uh, lockdown, the, the, the restrictions were very, very much strict because they couldn't even go out and do their uh, informal jobs. Because you know, most of them, their jobs that are doing, they are planting, they are cooking on the streets and so forth. So it was difficult for them. And through this, they were not involved in uh, government accessing them to, to assist them. So they, to address these issues, the South African Red Cross Society, uh, they had to find the inclusion just to involve everyone and not to leave everyone behind. So the South African Red Cross intervened by supporting the migrants with daily hot meals, food parcels, uh, testing, screening, contact tracing, and also assisting them with the public awareness. We are talking about risk community communication engagement that we were doing to the communities. So what we have done as the South African Red Cross, we wanted to pull them to be together and to assist them. And definitely, Gary, we did that uh, very much. So we also, as a South African Red Cross, um, integrated further, as you can um, remember uh, the numbers uh, with the gender-based violence. They went high uh, 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 during this uh, uh, pandemic. So with the South African Red Cross, uh, we have seen that uh, there was messages, the key messages that we have uh, uh, done uh, just to support uh, uh, this gender-based violence during this strict uh, lockdown. I thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, let me go to you, Marta. Uh, we've heard from every other group, um, but what has been the impact of COVID-19 on access to healthcare, and particularly for, for um, sexual and reproductive health? Uh, we don't think about, about the fact that people need to get to clinics that women and girls need to get to clinics because in so many societies they are neglected. Oh, well, thanks a lot for the invitation and this opportunity to share with all of you the challenges we are facing regarding specifically women's and girls' sexual and reproductive rights and health services. As you all have said, the COVID-19 pandemic has had an impact on health in general but also including everybody's capacity to access sexual and reproductive health services, but especially the vulnerable populations, as you mentioned at the beginning, the last mile communities, the measures to address the pandemic, uh, for social isolation, the border closures, the limitations to mobility has caused a severe socioeconomic impact. And at the same time, that has fostered gender-based violence worldwide. Pro Familia, the organization that I represent, has worked with the most, within the most disadvantaged settings. Um, and that has enabled us to collect relevant data during this year, which shows that it is a pressing need to guarantee universal healthcare during the pandemic, including concrete actions, resources, and institutional cooperation for SRHS in every country. Just to give you a concrete example, we have estimated that the, the decline in the services that we provide as a result of the Colombian lockdown between March and July 2020 has enabled us to prevent approximately 106,000 unwanted pregnancies, 38,000 unsafe abortions, and up to 26 maternal deaths. Um, and this is the information of just one organization in my country 
No wonder UNFPA report says that more than 7 million unintended pregnancies can happen in the, ne in the next coming months. As a healthcare provider, we have identified difficulties in the following subjects. The distribution and supply chain of uncontraceptive methods, such as condoms, administrative delays, and absolute lack of knowledge from health authorities and providers of the essential sexual reproductive health services that should continue in any sort of crisis. The further away the population lives, the less installed capacity you see. There are also difficulties such as high migration flows in areas that already have inadequate services and painful social exclusion. The absence of healthcare guidelines established for migrants and refugees make things worse. The adolescents and young women are experiencing barriers accessing menstrual hygiene, such, something as basic as that, but also contraceptive methods due to lack of money, but also to the shortages of commodities. The health institutions have limited consultations with the specialists, such as gynecologists and endocrinologists, with serious consequences for the early detection of ovarian and uterine cancer. The confinement measures have become the worst enemy for many girls and women, for it is within the walls of their homes that sexual violence is happening with absolute impunity. Digital tools and strategies work very well when you have connectivity and mobiles with plans that, you, that let you navigate. That is usually not the case of communities that live far away or in rural areas. So sexual reproductive services are fundamental to saving lives because they cover urgent and unending needs and they are articulated with achieving development and gender equality in our countries. Um, they are also part of the fulfillment of incorporating a gender approach and the implementation of the Agenda 2030, even during these times of pandemic. We think that in that sense, it is crucial to generate information on sexual and reproductive health needs during the pandemic, prioritizing the most vulnerable populations and their specific needs, young people, Afro and indigenous communities, people with disabilities, LGBTI included, we cannot leave them behind. We have to issue guidelines and carry out training processes. We have to strengthen the measures to guarantee access to contraceptive methods, and we have to monitor the supply chain of products. So it yeah. is imperative that sexual and reproductive health services and rights are included in programs and policies when addressing COVID-19 or any pandemic, so no one is left behind. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, I, want to, I want to throw a question at Jacqueline Wika. I just want to say to you all, however, we are seeing your questions coming in. Um, I would ask that the panel take a look at those questions. Um, after I've addressed one or two questions with Jacqueline, I'd like uh, you to raise your hand in response. To, to some of the questions below, I will, um, I, will, I will ask you some questions, so you be on standby. <laughs> um, but Jacqueline, my, my question to you is, what are some of the ways that governments or humanitarian actors can in fact adjust to, to ensure that migrants or, or refugees or nomadic uh, populations have access to health, act, uh, to healthcare? you know, uh, both um, Mohammed and Princess had uh, spoke about the challenges. Okay, well, actually, I was, I, I wanted to give you some, uh, uh, can you hear me well? Because yes, there was a problem can. early on, okay. Uh, some reflections on, 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 on challenges and opportunities and what, what the role of, of an agency like IOM is in this context. Um, uh, as we all know, migration is a global phenomenon and can be recognized as a determinant of health. The migration process exposes migrants to health risks such as dangerous journeys, psychosocial stresses, abuses, exposure to diseases, interrupted care, inaccessibility to services, and of course, substandard living and working conditions. Now, these challenges not only impact the well-being and the rights of migrants, but they endanger the public health and undermines the, the the positive contributions of migrants and migration uh, to our societies and the development goals. Now on the opportunities, the, 
the universal health coverage uh, in itself is our opportunity. It, it's, let's say, a vehicle for us to establish the needed partnerships and political outlets and to put in practice um, primary health care models that are accessible for all, including uh, migrant populations. So what is the role of IOM? Uh, IOM as a UN migration agency, we are really a multidisciplinary agency and health is a core component of all migration and population mobility issues for us in domain, domains such as migration and development, disease control, health security, global, uh, sorry, labor migration, occupational safety, disaster risk reduction, environmental change and so on. Um, and, and looking at our policy work and partnership work, we really connect the global migration and the global health agendas. I want to give you a few examples. Um, IOM works, has been working for decades closely with UNHCR and WHO in promoting health of refugees and displaced persons. So together with HCR, we are the key technical partners in the WHO Global Action Plan for promoting health of migrants and refugees. Other example, ILO and IOM work together to improve the migration of health workers and the health of migrant, of migrant workers, so both angles. We, of course, also work with stakeholders such as Global Fund as well as Gavi. I also should mention, and it's really important, to the newly created UN Network on Migration, for which IRM is the coordinator and the secretariat. This brings together 38 UN entities on migration issues to assist member states to implement the so-called Global Compact on Migration. In its first year, did this network already created a dedicated working group to support access of migrants to services like migrants. Uh, likewise, IRM works with agencies like uh, IFRC, Red Cross, Red Crescent Societies, as well as NGOs across the whole humanitarian development nexus. And this brings me to the operational capacity of an organization like IOM. And, and thanks to its global footprint of over 400 um, country offices, we really have access to migrants populations. And uh, looking at the, the, the COVID-19 realities, um, since early 2019, our staff have been on the front line providing health services and integrating public health measures in migration management through multi-sectoral approaches. Um, so uh, responses include population mobility mapping at points of entry, such as in, in the DRC, community-based disease surveillance, such as in returning Mozambican migrant workers from South Africa, continuity of essential health services, non-COVID health services, such as in Jordan and Libya, migrant-friendly risk communication and community engagement, like in Colombia, mental health and psychosocial support, and advocating for information, diagnostics, including tests and possibly vaccines, will be available to migrants and displaced. So a migrant inclusive approach is not just a moral right thing to do, it is also the right thing to do from a public health uh, perspective. Yeah. And yeah. I hope to make more concrete comments on the pandemic uh, later on during the discussion. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank Over. You so well, I'd, I'd like to just um, get a question through to you. I mean, how do we engage with communities who are so often left behind um, um, in a culturally appropriate and accessible way that we can ensure that they're receiving accurate and needed information, but in an environment that is appropriate for, for where they find themselves? Mm -hmm. Okay, if I understood your um, message quickly, I think the most important uh, point there is uh, the, the engagement of migrants themselves. They are a very important stakeholder in this. Migrants are not, should not be seen as a vulnerable, helpless group of people. Migrants are very innovative people, very strong people often. They may be in a vulnerable situation, but they come from all types of backgrounds and uh, they themselves can be uh, and, and must be engaged in development of programs, in advocacy. They are probably very good in, in, in coming up with innovative solutions, but they must be given a voice. And uh, so I would say that uh, engaging migrants themselves is a very important one. In fact, looking at um, the COVID itself, promoting the role of migrants uh, as a 
positive contributors to health and development and, and raising the profile of migrants in civil society. The health service, uh, it, it's very clear that they, they had a very key role in uh, the, the, the response uh, uh, themselves. Um, uh, in fact, migrants have been at the forefront of a lot of the COVID-19 responses as health professionals and uh, other frontline workers. And they should be recognized as co-developers and contributors to this and future global health actions, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to just take an opportunity on the live chat to alert everyone to um, the message just put up by, by James Millar. You'll find um, a document and a link to the Community and Civil Society Report for TB and COVID uh, that was launched this week. It's been very well received by the media. I think you will all find it hugely valuable. It's been ex excellently put together and I think it has wonderful, is a wonderful support document and a, a very valuable report just to take a look at. Um, Dalal, are you with us? Yes, I am. <laughs> there you are. How do we measure equitable access to treatment to, to make sure that we don't leave anyone uh, behind? I mean, how, how do we measure it? How do we ensure that it works? For example, in, in, in Palestine, to ensure that no one is left behind. I think the first thing I always like to say is to involve the people themselves. I mean, uh, the problem sometimes when you give per, uh, services or you give uh, treatment or you give any for persons who are excluded with disability, whatever, uh, and especially here and sometimes here in Palestine, it, people tend to um, deal with them as uh, only service, uh, you know, service in people who are, okay, they need access to information, they need access to the environment, they need access to treatment, but they don't, they're not actually asked or... I think in some, in some cases they're not really asked what what are they what do they need. So I think the most important thing is to how to evaluate a needs assessment approach. A needs assessment approach meaning that how to involve how the persons as um, uh, as was said how the persons have a voice in order to to be able to themselves decide for themselves what they need so that they don't feel, feel that they are left behind. The idea is not just, you know, provide me with this service or provide me with this treatment or provide me with access to this information. Is how can I myself depend on myself in getting this access to this information? So I think that's the most important thing is the involvement. That, and in order to measure, I think to measure that, I know it's not easy, but to measure that is to try to see how involved the person who is excluded or who is left behind can yeah. be order to make himself not be left behind, if you know what I mean. So basically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's basically, yeah. Do me just, just quickly and shortly, we are running out of time. How can we best have communities leading and engaging the COVID-19 response, ensuring that they that we still retain their dignity. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think the first thing, um, there are already some existing community health referral systems, particularly within the HIV response, to which I would like to believe that in Botswana has been a bit of a success, where we've had uh, different needs catered for because of community-led organizations. And no, um, I think the only unfortunate aspect is that obviously there aren't many social protections specifically mm -hmm. for volunteers. And um, you find that there are other social determinants that have an impact um, that have been mentioned, such as you know, gender-based violence and, and, and others. Um, and I think what's critical to that then is ensuring that um, there are equitable forms of participation. So that means at least in terms of deliberation, in terms of uh, social behavioral communications, and in terms of just the enablement of being able to uh, secure travel permits and at least be able to um, adequately provide for whether it's uh, uh, information, uh, uh, safe sex commodities, um, or even just uh, uh, other medicines. Um, so I think it's really quite critical for ensuring ensuring that um, they can always be, you know, uh, open platforms for communications where there are, for instance, technical working groups in Botswana, where we're at least able to appropriately align and respond to the COVID response, um, especially where there are shortcomings. Um, and I think it's really quite complementary when there are, uh, uh, I guess, maybe other resourcing mechanisms specifically for, you know, like emergency situations or nutrition and, and other needs that can be catered for because you need a holistic response and not just linear. Massimo, um, of course, you, 
you deal with a society that was already deeply, deeply discriminated against. Um, what is it going to take for um, people who live with, um, with drug abuse or are finding themselves challenged with drug abuse to, to be recognized and to be um, dealt with, with dignity when it comes to COVID-19 or tuberculosis? I think that uh, uh, we must favorize all kinds of therapies. Uh, a drug user who asks for help must be welcome. It's a very good thing. And this is not the case in the world because they are discriminated. Also, the institution put a lot of obstacles. Um, there is uh, a kind of selection of the motivation and we welcome the, the drug user who want to stop but we don't welcome the drug use that don't want to stop and sometimes they don't want because they cannot because this is their disease in some time they cannot stop and we must accept the the reality as it is and not as we would like that could be in, right. in this, uh, uh, I say that the true prevention is the treatment. And the treatment is something that can happen not uh, for one month or for two months. You need uh, to work for 10 years. It's a kind of love story that starts with the honeymoon and after 10 years, the love story is finished. This is the moment in which in which the drug user can stop, can stop. In these 10 years, we must help him. A, a fundamental role is done by the former drug user, because former drug use show that it's possible to stop. And they know all, all the history and they bridge the gap. They can bridge the gap. So in our activities, uh, the former drug user play a, a, a very important role. All right. Um, a, a very quick question. For those of you who are able to, um, Dalla will try and, and uh, send you some questions on Please. a different forum. But for those of you who can go to the Q&A section, if you see questions that you can type responses to, to, to assist those because we will be running out of time. By all means, please go to the Q. I'm speaking to my panelists. Please go to the Q&A forum and see which of those you can respond to. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is to Marta and uh, Santosh. The question is, how can we ensure that sexual and reproductive health is considered an important element of health in emergencies? Uh, because it, you know, it is so easily ignored, and that is so unfortunate. Let me, Mata, let me, let me go to um, Dr. Santosh first. Mata, why don't you take the question, please? Thank okay. you very much. Oh, oh, sorry, Dr. Santosh, I didn't see you. Please respond, Doctor. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for asking this question. This is. You, you'll be you'll be shocked to know that there is no sexual reproductive uh, health care in our transgenders people as of now. None of the people think about that we are also come under the sexual reproductive health, and they only think that we people are the uh, the only and one uh, position to uh, spread HIV AIDS infection. And this is the most, most, uh, you may say, it's a slang, it's a discrimination that never any of the agencies not think about or any of the organization not think that but we people are also come under that or we might come under that sexual reproductive health and rights. So the first thing is that. Second, which I feel that it's as a transgender organization, I would definitely want to share that we are the first organization who have started the work with women also. There we all clearly mentioned that sexual reproductive health and rights is for gender equality, not for man and woman and either for the transgender, for everybody. Because sex is everywhere 
with and and uh, which is very which is very important that uh, sorry there is a disconnection uh, there is a, some technical error is there and which is i think this is this is something which is very much missing in our life very very and which cause many of our transgender people those who are going under the castration and surgical uh, treatment and all they are been dying and they are going undergoes just because of that there is no no specific uh, uh, platform for the sexual rights and uh, sexual health and reproductive rights for the transgender people thank you oh our challenges do continue um mata your response from the community and society you work in please well definitely definitely i mean you have to start the government have to realize the impact i mean the numbers are there we have seen the consequences of not having good sexual reproductive rights and health policies implemented so it starts at the governments to make sure that they do have the policies but it also comes down to the social society that we can you know what we have been doing for so many years is reporting giving the data uh, um, having the, the, the civil society expressing their needs and the impact not having access to these health services as a right what, what, what the impact has in their lives it affects everything it affects a woman's a girl's capacity to finish school an unwanted pregnancy adolescence pregnancy it even impacts the capacity of a woman to have access to a job here in colombia the case of colombia more than half the homes are the 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 the, 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 the are in, in the care of women who take care of children so it starts i would say that it starts at the government making sure that they have the correct policies policies that guarantee our sexual reproductive rights in every sense in every it's a full rainbow you know and to understand that sexuality is something that accompanies a person's life from the start to the end from the beginning to the end it's something that is part of our living so yeah. we have to make sure that it is always there thank you mata a uh, princess in terms of um strengthening the healthcare uh support for for migrants um we know that there are inadequacies but what is it that we can do to ensure that that particular what would you say to the world if if you could about not leaving that community behind your mic is off princess thank you gary it is important because um the migrants they feel that uh, they've been left behind they've been discriminated and they've got nowhere where they can go to so as much as our government they have integrated them into our community um, in terms of them uh, to feel free in our communities i think it is with the government as well um, to teach our 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 communities or to have policies that uh, when we when we have programs in our communities we must involve them they must be given a role in advocacy they must be given a role so that they can be able uh, to to tell us what is their needs because at this present moment i feel like it is us that we are thinking for them and they don't have a voice so they don't have a place where they can go and 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 speak out what they need because they feel like they don't belong maybe into this country they don't have their rights into this country so i i i feel sad for them and i think the government um, as it is listening uh, to us as well they can be able maybe to to broaden uh, the regulations that they have so that the migrants they can be able to access the, the health uh, facilities in our country thank you
I think I just, uh, Jacqueline, if you're there, I, I would just like you to make some closing remarks. We have unbelievably run out of time. Um, I don't know how it happens. Is it the, the that boring topic? Online, topic. <laughs> or do we have a day for this conversation? I am so confused. But we have, um, run out of time. I okay. Want I want to make a quick comment. I do notice, thank you, Marta, that you've also put a link to information on the chats. Thank you. If anyone else has information that they would like to share with the broader community that is on this forum right now, please do just put the links in the chat uh, forum so that people can begin to understand who you are, what you do, and what you have to offer, how they can support you, how you can support them. Jacqueline, please close for us. Okay, just two points. Uh, indeed, COVID-19 does not discriminate and nor should our response. So the threat remains a virus, not people, not migrants, stranded or displaced persons. There is no us versus them here, okay? Discrimination and biases lead people to be more hesitant to come forward with symptoms and that doesn't help anybody. Second point, the dramatic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have embedded public health concerns in questions of migration and mobility at large, revealing the cr critical need to rethink immigration and border policy and practices. Some states have used public health concerns to justify blanket detention of undocumented migrants and refugees um, in overcrowded facilities with detainees and staff being exposed to risks of infection. Many migrant workers have found themselves stranded in countries of destination and transit, while others have had their visas revoked or suspended. A, a central imperative will be how to fully integrate health, border and mobility management approaches, including current international health regulations. They are being reviewed by the way, by WHO and um, committee, with the attention to build core capacities, adequate surveillance infrastructure, and improve data sharing within and between countries. We all have a role to play here. When it comes to care vaccines, please look into the COVAX facility. We, us, on the round the table, we have to ensure that part of vaccines, vaccines will be available for the vulnerable groups that we have been talking about today. The COVAX facility may hopefully be uh, helping us here. Thank you very much for this very important event and allowing me to speak. Thank you, over. Yeah, thank you so much. At the beginning of COVID-19, um, I've worked in TB for many, many years. And at the beginning of COVID-19, two things occurred to me. And the one was that so much of the support that had been given to TB sufferers will now go elsewhere. The healthcare workers will go there. Even some of the learnings and regiments uh, or, or the manner in which we, we would roll out a TB uh, program or support would now go to, um, to COVID-19 uh, sufferers. And it really bothered me, and it still does, that so many of our people, knowing that they need treatment daily or monthly because non-compliance can be detriment to their health, will now not have, have the support. And uh, now that the reports are coming out, we're discovering that in a minimum of five years, our progress will be lost. Six million additional people will become ill with TB. Um, you know, TB used to kill 1.5 million people across all of our groups that we work in. And now that number will increase exponentially. Um, one of the bylines for this particular meeting and the reports going around is build back better. We are going to have to rebuild, but we also have to go back. And none of us can be tired, none of us who work in TB can say that we have exhausted anything globally. A three-month lockdown um, and a protect, protracted 10-month restoration period could lead to an additional 6.3 million cases of TB. Um, I must rely on you as you need to rely on me to ensure that we win this battle. So I thank you 
for your support. I thank you on behalf of the organizations who put this together for your time on this forum. But now we need to go get off the Zoom call, but we need to go back to the drawing board, right? And we need to figure out more ways. And sadly, it might be with fewer resources that we still retain the support um, and the advocacy that we are able to give to the groups that we represent. So thank you to, I hope I encouraged you, be encouraged. We have to do this. Um, the work has, we thought we had done the work, something pushed us back, but we will not be discouraged, right? <laughs> We will not be discouraged because our people need us. So thank you so much for coming on board. Thank you to the organizations that are working tirelessly to bring support. Thank you to the, the Red Cross, but all the other organizations, the uh, Director for Migration for Health Division for IOM for coming on board for everyone on this call. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, hopefully we can all get together when all this is done and we can really put our shoulder to the plow and do what needs to be done. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye Princess. Bye, Martha. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.